about, so firstly, I'll give a little bit of background on what I'm about, what I do, and then I'm going to talk about uh, Ireland's protection system, and I'm going to talk about the links between the Irish system and the European Union and international uh, influences, because Ireland's system is not a standalone system. It's very much influenced by EU policy, uh, and it's also influenced by international events, as you will see from the presentation. Um, I mean, my office is, uh, was established in 2000. Uh, it deals with what's known as international protection applications, uh, and I'll explain what they are in a minute. But, um, you know, we have about 100 uh, full-time staff, but we also have about 50 to 60 lawyers who work with us as well, who help us to process the cases. Uh, so we, we work in teams, so we have um, teams of, say, three or four lawyers led by a uh, civil servant because the final decisions have to be signed by a civil servant, but the lawyers do the interviews uh, and they write the reports. And the reports are actually legally um, you know, vetted reports because they have to comply with the law and all our decisions are appealable to the Refugee Appeals Tribunal, which is a quasi-judicial uh, body, and you know, they can also end up as judicial, reform, judicial review before the High Court. And anyone who's familiar with refugee law will know that there's a substantial jurisprudence in this area uh, compared with 10 years ago when there wasn't a lot of cases, well, certainly 15 years ago now, there's a substantial body of law uh, about my office, about the Refugee Appeals Tribunal, and about the immigration and asylum system generally. Um, so in addition, we also uh, process applications for family reunification. So when someone gets refugee status in Ireland, they're entitled to apply to bring their uh, family or certain members of their family to Ireland. And uh, we process those cases. The final decisions are made by the Department of Justice, but we actually would do the analysis, do the background research, and effectively give a recommendation. And in fact, all our decisions, or all our decisions are in fact recommendations, because at the end of the day, the Minister for Justice makes the final decision. But in most cases, it's basically a rubber stamping job, because we would have all the researchers uh, we would do all the interviews and the minister, you know, uh, is, it basically just signs them in a small unit in, in the department. They wouldn't have the resources to revisit the whole thing because that would actually would be ineffective. We also uh, input into developments at EU level. Uh, in Brussels, there, are, uh, there is an asylum working party um, and all of the EU proposals for a form of asylum, it is a substantial, non um, it is a substantial amount of them, going through council at any one time, uh, we would send officials along with the department. And we also represent uh, Ireland at the European Asylum Support Office, which is a practical cooperation office recognised by EU law. And again, I'll talk about that. And I'm a deputy chairperson. The chair of that is an Austrian. He's head of the asylum office in, in Vienna. I'm deputy chair. And then we have a management board comprising all of the EU states uh, the European Commission and the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees and we meet three or four times e a year to look at the overall system of asylum in, in Europe from an operation perspective and um, you know operational and practical cooperation between states. Um, so what is protection? For us in Ireland there are two forms of protection, international protection. There's uh, protection as a refugee and there's protection for what's known as subsidiary protection, which is very much based on EU law. Refugee status is based on the United Nations uh, Geneva Convention on, relating to the status of refugees. The subsidiary protection regime, which I'll tell you about in a minute, is based very much on EU law. So what is an asylum seeker? What is a refugee? An asylum seeker is really an applicant for asylum, but it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to get asylum because uh, they have to satisfy the criteria. So the criteria is very much a person owing to a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion is outside their country of origin, arrive in Ireland and apply for protection. And after interviews, uh, assessments of country of origin information, in other words, can their story they're telling us stand up uh, and an analysis of the claim, we decide are they uh, going to comply with that def 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 definition of a refugee. And, uh, but as an asylum seeker, you're an applicant. As a refugee, you're 
the person who actually gets the status. Um, that's a simple definition, but it's actually a little bit more complex than that. Uh, but in general terms, that's what it is. Then we also have what's known as subsidiary protection, and that's really if you're not eligible for refugee status, you can satisfy what's known as a serious harm test, which is defined as, for example, the death penalty, torture, inhuman or degrading treatment in your country of origin. And if you satisfy that test, in other words, if you have a real risk of suffering serious harm, and it's under EU law, you can also qualify for what's known as subsidiary protection. And it's a different, it's, it's a different term to persecution, but if effectively the actual outcomes are the same. You're entitled to stay in Ireland, you're entitled to work, you're entitled to study. Uh, eventually, uh, if you're so many years in the country, you could qualify for Irish citizenship, and you're entitled to family unification. So even though it's a different form of protection, the rights, obligations, benefits flowing from it are fairly much the same. Um, our protection system is uh, very much, as I said, uh, the circle there in, in the middle, and flowing into that is EU law, domestic law, and international law. Now, obviously, primarily for us, it's domestic law, but our legislation has to be compatible with EU law. And also, it's very much based in international law. In particular, I'm talking about the 1951 Geneva Convention, and it is a protocol of 1967, and that, in fact, effectively sets out the definition of who is a refugee, which I already showed you. So Irish law, the Refugee Act 1996, uh, imports the key principles from that uh, international convention, but we are also importing the EU regulations and directives. There's a, a body of EU law, which I'll mention in a second, dealing with asylum. It goes back, um, you know, it goes back certainly to around 2000, 1999, 2000, when it started to be developed. And it's been through a number of various stages. We started off with minimum standards, and now there's common standards. And all of those regulations and directives, uh, the directives in particular, all our legislation has to be compatible with them. So when we bring in new law, uh, we have to make sure it complies with EU law. And uh, in a, you know, our Refugee Act, which, is what, which has been amended many times, which we're using at the moment for the purpose of our processing, we're going to replace that, uh, hopefully by the end of this year, by what's known as an International Protection Act. So we're in the process at the moment of undergoing substantial reform in the Irish protection process. Uh, moving from a multi-state process, which I'll say something about in a second, to a much more consolidated uh, single procedure. So that's the framework in which we operate. And the institutions, uh, the Office of the Refugee Applications Commissioner, I look at cases at first instance, which basically means the initial application for asylum and for subsidiary protection. And then the applicants who don't get status with me are entitled to appeal to the Refugee Appeals Tribunal. And then the final decision, particularly in relation to deportations and there's another form of humanitarian permission which you can get, is made by the Minister for Justice. So that's effectively, it's a multi-layered process. And some would argue that it has given a rise to a lot of inefficiencies. And you'll see uh, later that I'm going to tell you about what we've been doing to deal with that and reform our process and those reforms we're planning to bring in at the end of the year. So in terms of application numbers, um, you can see there's always been a sort of a, an, an up and a down. I mean, uh, the highest numbers over the years have been around 2002 when we had 11,000 applicants. Now you might say, well, compared with 100,000 or 50,000, not a lot, but it has been a lot uh, for the institutions that were there. So substantial resources had to be put into them uh, around 2002, 2003. And then the numbers began to fall and they began to rise again last year up to 3,200. These are refugee status applications. So you can see for 2015, we had 3,276 applicants, and they're the main countries, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Albania, Nigeria, India. Um, and then for this year, up to July, the numbers are running lower than last year. We expect to have about 2,000 applicants this year, and they're coming from Pakistan, Zimbabwe, Nigeria, Albania, Afghanistan. So, you know, the composition, uh, you know, it changes, but you know, certain countries, for example, Pakistan, 
uh, Nigeria you know, would figure large uh, over the years, and Nigeria in particular has been, there have been applicants, substantial numbers of applicants over the years from Nigeria. And then if you compare that with uh, what's going on generally in the world, I had one of my colleagues do some research today, and you can see, so in 2015, Ireland had 3,000 applications, but in the EU, there was 1 million, 1.3 million uh, international protection applications. Uh, and in 2016 to date, uh, there's 632 applications for international protection, 632,000 in the European <coughs> Union. But again, the key countries are Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq, and they haven't really changed uh, last year to this year. But we don't, we see some of those countries, but we don't get a lot of Syrian applicants uh, coming directly to Ireland. We take Syrians through the EU, EU relocation <coughs> program, which I'll talk to you about in a second. So it just gives you a, an example of what the Irish protection process is about. We've structures, we've legislation, and we've got a, a flow of applicants. And it's their job, basically, when the people come to us, to take the application, to register them, uh, to give them a card, which is basically, uh, like, it's not an identity card, but it's very like an IT card, our photograph is on it, um, and they're also uh, fingerprinted, and they're registered. And then, after about uh, so many weeks, they're given their first interview, and, you know, it's an interview which can go on for two to three hours, and a lot of them are, a lot of the applicants are supported by lawyers, uh, with a lot of research. Then the interviewer, who is always a lawyer at the, uh, trained in this area, trained by the United Nations High Commission of Refugees, will then research the case, look at the representations that have been made, why do you want to be recognised as a refugee, uh, will research the case against country of origin information, which might be supplied by the United Nations High Commission for Refugees, which might be supplied by the UK Home Office, which might be supplied by the Canadian uh, asylum refugee board. We, we, we input into a lot of sources, uh, Amnesty International, and we use primarily for our research, we have a small research department ourselves, but we use primarily the Refugee Documentation Centre, which is attached to the Legal Aid Board. They have permanent researchers there, and they have uh, IT systems, some of which are supported by the European Asylum Office, which, which try and get the up-to-date research, what is happening in Syria, what is happening in uh, Nigeria, what is happening in Pakistan, and if this, whatever story is told to us, we try and assess that against the country of origin information. And you, you know, this information can be quite detailed. For example, if someone says they uh, were through a particular incident in a particular part of a country, you can actually home in now on that part of the country. You can, use, you can actually use Google Maps to go down into the street they talk about. And if they say, you could ask questions about, you know, you know what school did you go to? You know, what religion are you? Tell us something about the religions. Tell us something about the area you're from. Tell us something about the persecution. And you can literally, it's like going in on a, on, 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 you know, a, a microscope. You can actually, you know, zoom in right into the area. And you can use then uh, examples of similar cases from other countries through networks we have. And you can come up with um, an assessment of whether there is a reasonable case that they should be granted refugee status. Now, we don't always get it right, but um, the quality of our decisions are uh, proved by the United Nations, and in general, uh, because we put in a lot of extra work over the years to improve the quality of our decisions, to bring in trained lawyers, uh, to use quality research, in general, the feedback from the United Nations for the work we do is very positive, which I'm glad to say. It wasn't always like that. There was, we were subject to a lot of criticism over the years, uh, but things have improved. Our recognition rates are around, for refugee status, about 16%, but they're much higher for subsidiary protection. So subsidiary protection could be over 20%. So it depends, you know, on, on the story you, you, you tell. You could either qualify as a refugee or you could qualify for subsidiary protection. Um, so briefly, the common EU asylum policy, as I said, is one of the influences on what we do. That's a, a series of regulations and directives uh, agreed at European Union level since uh, 2000, but there have been revisions of them, and they're dealing with procedures for protection. So what is the application procedure? What quality interview do you have to do? What type of um, analysis do you have to apply? What procedures do you have to apply for determining who is entitled to international protection? So that's set out in an EU directive. So we have to import that into our national law. So 
it, the, the, tempt, the, the, the logic behind it is to try and ensure a consistency of approach across the European Union. Now, that isn't actually being achieved, uh, which is one of the reasons the European Asylum Office was set up, but it's, it's the logic behind it. Similarly, the eligibility criteria, what are the criteria must satisfy to get international protection? That's in a directive. There are minimum standards for reception conditions, so what quality accommodation must you provide? Uh, do you have to employ, uh, allow asylum seekers to work? What minimum levels of health care? What minimum levels of education? Access to social assistance? They are covered to some extent by the reception conditions directive. Then a critical directive, which I'm sure even if you're not working in this area, you've heard of what's known as the Dublin regulation. That receives a lot of publicity. And that is a regulation that's on its third version at the moment and the fourth one being discussed at EU level. It's all about what country in the European Union uh, is the country that processes your application. So just because you come to Ireland, it doesn't necessarily mean Ireland will process your application. It's normally based on the first country in which you make your asylum application. But there's a lot of other criteria. For example, if you have family members in another country, you might, it might be in your interest to be reunited with them and have your application processed in that country. But it's primarily what country you apply in first. So when applicants come in to us, we take their fingerprints. That's compared with an, uh, what's known as the Eurodac fingerprinting system, which is a central EU system. And that will tell you if you've applied for asylum in another country. Then we have to go to that country through a formal IT network we have, and a decision is made which country processes the application. So you, just, you don't necessarily get processed in the country you come to. And that's, that's based on the Eurodac system. It's not just fingerprint, it's whether you've had visas issued by other countries, whether you've had residence permits issued by other countries. So in my office, there is a section of, I think, 12 people dealing with these cases. They told me last week that at least 500 decisions have been made this year uh, that Ireland is not the country to process uh, applications. So, I mean, there's a, there's, you know, there's a lot of toing and froing between EU states. Um, because we wanted to achieve a common approach, operational approach, uh, common standards, uh, the European Union decided uh, to set up uh, in 2010 a European Asylum Support Office. Uh, that's an executive agency of the European Union. It's based in Malta. And uh, its role is basically to try through, uh, you know, through operation cooperation, to try and ensure common standards in relation to training, in relation to country of origin research, uh, in relation to best practice on quality, you know, what quality should your decision be? And the logic behind it was that there has been a lot of criticism uh, internationally, particularly on the part of NGOs, but also on the part of states, that if, for example, you're an Afghan and you come to Ireland, or if you're the same Afghan and you go to Sweden, you might necessarily get the same decision. And, you know, the idea behind the European asylum policy is that, you know, the outcomes should reasonably be the same. And, uh, you know, so because that wasn't happening and because the uh, possibility of, a, of practical cooperation at EU level was very limited before 2010 because officials were mainly dealing with writing legislation and meeting in working groups discussing legislation, there was no real discussions on cooperation. So the asylum office was set up, uh, has about 100 staff, and it's, it's setting, it has processes to bring to work on qualities, common training programs, uh, common country of origin research, and, and these standards where officials from each of the countries meet and they produce best practice guides. Uh, you know, at, there is a new proposal out in the last uh, six months for to, to, to turn the office into a European agency with much stronger powers. And there's a huge debate going on in, in Europe at the moment about how strong should that office be compared with limited practical cooperation. Should it have enforcement powers? Should it eventually be able to have, should it be a central processing office in the European Union to process all the claims, maybe with branch offices in various countries? So all that debate is going on at the moment. But um, it also provides emergency support. So uh, for countries like Greece and Italy, whose systems have been under substantial pressure over the last few years, um, the European Asylum Office provides practical support. So it goes to countries like Ireland, the uh, UK, France, Sweden, and 
if the Greeks need, for example, in the Dublin Regulation Unit assistance with building up their um, governance arrangements, uh, their operational, uh, the operation of those units, they would come to Ireland, they would go to the UK, they would go to Sweden to say, have you got two experts or four experts that we could send to Greece for three weeks to try and enhance the ability of them to do their job in that area? And that's been going on all the time. Experts are moving between states, helping other states out. Um, it also looks at information and analysis, and it provides, it's moving into the whole area of support for third countries, non-EU states, so we're providing support in Africa in particular to countries who have very uh, mediocre asylum processes. They just don't have the capacity. So the European Asylum Office, through various EU aid programs, provides experts to help them build their systems. Um, so the European migration crisis. There's been a major crisis in Europe in, I'm talking about refugees and asylum seekers, that's what I'm here to talk about, but there has been a major migration crisis. And in particular, 2015, 2016, where at particular times of the year, uh, there have been major flows of people uh, into the European Union. Now the flows in particular are coming, or were coming, uh, to Greece, and now you see the publicity are coming mainly to Italy. And those people are coming in some cases from you know, serious areas of conflict, uh, Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq. Um, in the case of Italy, Eritrea, there's a serious human rights situation in Eritrea. Um, Somalia, there's, there's major governance issues there. Sudan, there's difference in between South and North Sudan, as you may be aware. So, those countries are fleeing, or those people are fleeing their countries of uh, origin. They're making their way with the assistance in many cases of traffickers or uh, people to whom they pay money. And they're coming in the case of uh, the African states over the desert areas into Libya in particular. And they're making their way then by boat to Italy. Now the boats possibly don't get that far. Uh, some of them sink. But in other cases, there are uh, navies working together. There's an Irish naval vessel there at the moment, there has been for some time, who obviously carry out rescues. Now, those people are then brought to Italy. They were brought to Malta, but a lot of them brought to Italy. And um, in the case of Greece, uh, they were traveling by boats uh, run by traffickers from Turkey uh, into Greece. And when they arrive in these countries, there really wasn't the capacity there to, to, to actually help them. And you can see the numbers, 2015, 857,000, Italy, 153,000. These are the 2016 figures, uh, 160,000 for Greece, 70,000 for Italy, but that's to the end of June. These numbers have grown, particularly for Italy, over the summer months. I don't have the up-to-date statistics, but the latest statistics we have are there. Um, the Greek numbers, so basically what happens when they come? I mean, there was chaos, the Italians, uh, and the Greek authorities just couldn't cope. So the European Union decided to bring in what was known as a relocation program, which Ireland is taking part in, and it's based on two council decisions, and there's also an agreement with Turkey. And those, um, those programs, particularly the relocation programs, are geared towards uh, inviting people who are in Greece and Italy to apply for relocation to other EU states. Now, there is a formula. Uh, everyone wouldn't be entitled to relocation. It's really only groups from nationalities where there's, in general, a 75% more or more grant rate. So if, if you are 75% from a group that's 75% likely to get uh, asylum in an EU country, and you're talking about countries like Syria, countries like Eritrea, but the, but the list changes, uh, you can qualify for what's known as relocation. And what that means is that you're, in, you're, you're, you're invited to apply, you are registered, and uh, then eventually you are processed and you're brought over to uh, other EU states. That will process your asylum application. So it's, it's an attempt to take the pressure off the Italian and the Greek systems 
Uh, but at the same time, to ensure that there is a fair uh, you know, a process uh, put forward in order to ensure that the, the people who need protection get it. Now, Ireland has been working in this programme for some time now, and we've had people over in uh, the Greek islands. Uh, we've also had them in Italy, but mainly on the Greek islands, basically registering people for relocation. We've also, uh, my staff have been over there doing what's known as vulnerability assessments. So we actually talk to people, um, you know, who have been through traumatic uh, events in Syria in particular. And we, you know, what we do is we, you know, obviously register them for relocation. Um, so they either go into the Greek asylum process first or they're registered for relocation uh, eventually. And then they, they qualify for moving, moving into another EU state. Now, you know, some applicants, uh, you know, did not qualify because we didn't believe they were asylum seekers at all. They were economic migrants, so they wouldn't qualify for the programme. And, you know, they, they basically uh, were, were put into a category which were going to be returned uh, to Turkey. And that's what that agreement was about. But in terms of the people coming uh, into the relocation programme, they were asylum seekers and their claims would have to be processed. Now, the numbers were slow at the start. Uh, for relocation. The main reason it was slow was it was inefficient. It wasn't run properly at the start. Uh, people were not being registered. People were not being given information. But the European Asylum Support Office uh, used EU experts, including Irish experts, British experts, Swedish, Netherlands, Germans, to go out and set up what's known as hotspots. And people were brought to these hotspots, given accommodation, the hotspots at the moment are in, uh, in Greece, on the Greek islands, Lesbos and some of the other islands. They're all registered there. Some of them have their cases processed uh, along the lines I told you, but they're registered there and then they're put into what's known as relocation, uh, the relocation programme. We have made pledges in Ireland to take groups of people, um, but so far the, the numbers coming are quite small, but you know it's ratcheting up as far as I can see. So. Um, in terms of Ireland, our numbers have been very, very small, but we have set up what's known as the Irish Refugee Protection Programme, which is a multi-agency programme. There's a programme office in the Department of Justice, and we're starting to get people from the pledges because we put pledges in and the people weren't even available or there were problems with registering, but since we slowly started to get staff out there, we have begin to register more people and they've started to come. So, you know, you can see the numbers have arrived so far. Uh, last week there was another 30 came in, uh, we're expecting uh, another group of 60 over the coming weeks. My, so what happens is my staff goes out, the, the, we tell the Greeks we want 60 more people, they send over 60 files, we go through the files, we then go out uh, to Athens and those 60 people are interviewed uh, and they're also given what's known as orientation programmes about what is Ireland about, what is our culture about, what is our history about, just to ensure they understand that the country they're coming to is, is different from what they left. And then we have guards out there, Garda Shikana, who carries out, uh, who carry out security checks. So the numbers are small, but relocate, it's, it's other countries are involved as well. So that's one of the ways in which pressure is being taken off the European uh, Union, uh, EU, I'm talking, I'm talking about Greece and Italy in particular, uh, because their system couldn't cope, people are being put into the programs. Now it's, it's more effective for Greece because they have a much more uh, s comprehensive support program in place now. It's more difficult uh, with regard to Italy. They're, it's a much slower process for the Italians to, 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 to get numbers into the relocation process. But certainly for Greece, it's working quite well. Um, so anyway, that's what it's about. So in terms of the challenge for protection in the EU, the relocation program has been the European Union's response to the pressures that are being put on Greece and Italy. Uh, it's a sharing of the burden, uh, a sharing of asylum seekers, which is to ensure that everyone gets an interview and everyone gets a decision and everyone gets a determination. Now, all of the applicants that have come to Ireland have had their decisions, uh, apart from the 30 that came last week, and they get their decisions certainly within a number of months. And they've all been granted refugee status because they've all been Syrians. So we haven't really done comprehensive interviews. We've done very light touch interviews because once we know they're from Syria, well, we, we really assess them uh, to be eligible for, or for refugee status. Um, 
So, so that's really our response to that. Now, what are the challenges? Um, the challenges for my office over the, the next year or so, and for, for Ireland in particular, is that there's a, new, there's a new single procedure, a new International Protection Act coming in uh, at the end of the year. And that's going to um, repeal all the existing law that I've spoken to you about for Ireland. And we're basically going to move from a multi-stage process whereby my office did some protection decisions, the minister did some more, to a situation where everything is done by means of what's known as a single procedure. So any ground you have for refugee status, subsidy protection, and any other reasons you want to stay in the state, you will, we will process all them together uh, as part of one process. At the moment, they're, they're, they're processed at different stages, which is a very long drawn out process. So we're the only country that doesn't have a single procedure in the European <coughs> Union at the moment. And we're also establishing an international protection office. So the Refugee Application Commissioner's Office is being abolished, but it's been turned into what's known as an international protection office, which will bring all the legislation together that we have at the moment into one act and process them as part of a single procedure. Then you can appeal to the International Protection Appeals Tribunal, which is a new tribunal being set up at the end of the year to replace the Refugee Appeals Tribunal. And if you don't get refugee status or subsidy protection from my office, you can appeal to the International Protection Appeals Tribunal, which is entitled to give you status as well. Um, and the whole process is streamlined, it's more efficient use of resources, it's, it should lead to speedier decisions provided we get the resources, and it gives applicants clarity with their status. Because the problem with the Irish protection process over the years has been it's been a very slow process. Even though first instance, which is my office, might work speedily at times, there could be delays in the tribunal. Or if you leave the tribunal and you go to the minister to deal with the final leg of the process, which is what's known as humanitarian leave to remain, you could be waiting for years. So you could be in the process for years. People are stuck in direct provision accommodation, which is basically state-provided accommodation. Uh, they've, you know, they've no rights, they've limited entitlements. And you know, the, the, the view was that it's, it's a much fairer process if it could be streamlined. And so that's the answer to what, we've, uh, what, what the problems are and the challenges are. So maybe in a year's time, we'll, we'll let you know if we ever come back here again, uh, how, we, how we're getting on. Um, the other big challenge is reforms in EU law. At the moment, as I said, there's a substantial number of directives and regulations dealing with asylum, but there are new versions of them out at the moment and they are being discussed. So the, the, most of them are on Rev 3 at the moment, whereas, um, you know, so it's basically the third go at a regulation or a directive. In the case of Dublin, the Dublin regulation, we're on Rev 4. So, you know, it, it, it's, it's based on practice, experience, what works, what hasn't worked. New ideas come out from the European Commission and the member states meet in the working parties and eventually in council. Now it's a, a process that will go on for a number of years. But so the next year or so, we'll see a big priority on reforms of EU law, and that will then influence our domestic law. So wherever comes out and we decide to participate in, it means more amendments to domestic law. And the final challenge we have is very much about relocation, ratcheting up the programmes, assisting Greece and Italy that are under pressure, Italy more at the moment, uh, and bringing people over to Ireland in greater numbers uh, to have their applications processed here. I sort of gave you an overview. That's the best I can do in the time available. Thank you very much.